Indrani Di will uh, introduce the chair. Yeah. Yes. So should I begin? Yes. Please. Okay. Hello all. A very warm welcome to the last session of today's conference. And this is the special keynote address by Professor Tom Mylon. We welcome you, sir. The chair for this session is Professor Isabel Karaman. Isabel Karaman is professor in the Department of English, University of Zurich. She is the principal investigator on the SPARC project, New Terrains of Consciousness. She is also one of the initiators of the International Research and Teaching Project, Literature in a Globalized World, which was conducted between Würzburg University and JNU Delhi from 2016 to 2020. Over the last five years, she repeatedly visited JNU Delhi as a research fellow and guest professor, supervising doctoral thesis and giving lectures. She left Woodsburg University in 2019 to take up a professorship for English literature at the University of Zurich, where she continues her work on the literary history of globalization with a project centered on the Robinson Library, a unique archive of about 4,000 editions, translations and adaptations of Daniel Defoe's novel, Robinson Crusoe. We welcome you, ma'am, and thank you for joining us. I would now request you, ma'am, to take over the proceedings. Thank you, Indrani, with pleasure. Um, dear colleagues, dear students, it's a great honor and pleasure to introduce to you our distinguished next speaker, Professor Tom Moylan. Tom Moylan is Glucksman Professor Emeritus in the School of English, Irish and Communication and Adjunct Professor in the School of Architecture at the University of Limerick, Ireland, where he's also the founding director of the Rella Hine Center for Utopian Studies and acts as series editor of the Rella Hine Utopian book series. Professor Moylan is the recipient of the North American Society for Utopian Studies Distinguished Scholar Award and the Science Fiction Research Association Pilgrim Award. Utopia is the theme which Professor Moylan has devoted his prolific successful career to. In two monographs, Demand the Impossible, Science Fiction and the Utopian Imagination, and Scraps of the Untainted Sky, Science Fiction, Utopia, Dystopia, as well as several edited collections and numerous essays, he has considered the relations between utopia and dystopia from the perspectives of literary studies, theology, pedagogy, and political agency. This last aspect, political agency, is what makes him such an important speaker at a conference devoted to mapping new terrains of consciousness in and for a globalized world. Utopia in Professor Moylan's work is not a form of apolitical escapism, not a nowhere place that we can flee to from the harsh realities of our world today. On the contrary, utopia is a mode of engaging with the world so as to change our perception of it. It is a process of inhabiting the world differently, of making it different, of becoming different oneself. Mm. As one becomes utopian, Moylan claims, one becomes a stranger in one's own familiar land. And this is a precondition for ethical action and political agency. Because becoming a stranger in one's own land brings us closer to the global experiences of migrants, refugees, and asylum seekers, or indeed those who are treated as second-class citizens in their own countries, prevented from fully belonging to a society that excludes them on grounds of race, caste, or religion. The work of Utopia therefore lies not in escapism, but in staying with the trouble, to borrow Donna Haraway's phrase, while envisaging new modes of being, new modes of belonging. Today's utopianism in Professor Moylan's definition is transgressive, totalizing and transformative. It takes us beyond the limits of our knowledge and perception. It explores relationships with and across the world on a planetary scale, and it aims at socioeconomic, political, and ecological change. To quote a line from his most recent book, to be utopian is to become a radical change agent. 
This book, Becoming Utopian, The Culture and Politics of Radical Transformation, is a collection of Professor Moylan's most important essays on utopian thinking and has just been published to great acclaim with Bloomsbury Press. Today, Professor Moylan will speak on Becoming Utopian, Exploring the Praxis of Making a Better World. Esteemed colleague, over to you. Greetings from Ireland to all of you. I want to begin by thanking you, Professor Karaman, Isabel, for your very thoughtful and very welcoming introduction. I also want to thank the organizing committee for your kind and efficient facilitation of my presentation today. I very much wish I could have traveled to be with you all face to face, but then again, needs must. And perhaps we're all saving carbon miles this way. I need to fix my screen here. All right. Oh. Well, we will continue. Um, therefore, I'm honored and humbled to be with you all um, in this form. And I have to say that I'm very inspired to bring the focus uh, by the previous presentation and the discussion. Uh, and I will try to bring the focus and ongoing concerns of my own work to bear on your deliberation over these days. I'm particularly drawn to your aim to explore as your call for papers puts it, a critical reflection on the making and remaking through assemblages. Really, something's not working, I'm sorry. Professor Moylan, we can see you and hear you perfectly well. Yeah, I can't see myself. Okay. Not that I want to, but. I'm feeling. I'm feeling left out. <laughs> oh, well, we'll continue. We'll go on. I was talking about your call for papers and the critical reflection on the making and remaking through assemblages and coming together of strategies of world making that generate ways in which embodied and spatially located humans and earth others can build a new form of what Gayatri Spivak calls a planetary imaginary. And to this, I would add the complementary category of a planetary agency comprised of humanity and all of nature. In doing so, as Professor Karaman said, I will work from the substance of my recent book, Becoming Utopian, as I reprise its central problematic and develop its unfolding in relation to the categories of subject formation, standpoint, and activism, in particular, the practices of political organizing and critical pedagogy. And so to begin, it's not yet the worst of times, but things are worse every day. It's far from the best of times. Harm abounds everywhere. The overdetermined crises that have been with us for a good while are nearing conjunctural explosion. Ecologically, planetary nature is facing a downward spiral of near total destruction. Economically, neoliberal capitalism is exploiting all aspects of human and non-human life. Politically, the matrix of corporate and superpower aggression privileges the super rich and super powerful even as it subjects the majority of people around the world to intensifying vulnerability. And the surge of war, disease, starvation, and immiseration, along with the normalization of enslaved and precarious work, is destroying the vitality of everyday life in all corners of the earth. Legally, culturally, and existentially, a virulent xenophobia is attacking humanity for multiple modes of perceived difference as fascistic movements rise from a fetid swamp of hatred and feed official and individual rage. And so the work before us all 
in all our intersexual solidarity today and every day going forward is to explore new strategies of world making and new forms of agency. Speaking from my standpoint, I suggest that it is time for the political exercise of the transformative utopian impulse. However, if we choose to engage a, pro a utopian problematic in praxis, we must be wise to the ways in which capitalism's retrieval mechanism subsumes and consumes, as Mark Fisher puts it, the radical potential of utopianism. On one hand, by outright condemnation, on the other, by, co by co-optation. Thus, while a compliant erasure of utopia is encouraged by capitalist realism, a concomitant enclosure restricts utopia's anticipatory agencies in a false dawn of managerial innovations that replicate rather than revolutionize present reality. As these apparently positive maneuvers affect the shrinkage of the utopian impulse within a resigned dystopian structure of feeling, or what Vandana Singh has called dystopia porn, the utopian project itself is co-opted and compromised by way of sanctioned practices of inspirational improvement within the existing order of things. What we are witnessing, educational critic Darren Webb argues, is quote, the domestication and recuperation of utopia for the subversive counter hegemonic thrust of utopia has been tamed and rendered fit as he puts it for its instrumental use in the present order. In these conditions, the totalizing analysis and capacity for realization implicit in utopia's radical potential can be destroyed by an entrapment within pleasurable cynicism, even as it is recouped in an instrumentalized creative openness that plays no part in a dialectic of transformative intervention. Against this toxic resignation and complicity, what is needed is a utopian standpoint and practice that can break through this provincial temporality and point to a range of possibilities out of which critical and transformative visions and practices can emerge. If therefore we, in all our intersectional diversity, choose to change this oppressive maneuver, then it's time to throw off the shackles of dystopian despair and exercise what, what Rebecca Solnit describes as hope in the dark and embrace what Sarah Ahmed describes as, quote, hopeful acts of refusal and rebellion, as well as the quiet ways we might have of not holding on to things that diminish us. If we are to work with such a utopian proclivity, then we need to confront these vampiric practices that suck radical energy out of social, indeed, ecological reality. Recalling Frederick Jameson's Cohen, we need to remember that the deepest vocation of utopia is to remind us of our constitutional inability to imagine utopia itself. And this not owing to any individual failure of imagination, but as a result of the systemic cultural and ideological closure of which we are all in one way or another prisoners. <clears throat> And so we need to remember that the first move in the utopian process must be one that refuses systemic enclosure. In other words, the first step is negation, or as Marx put it, the ruthless critique of all that exists. Only from this negative standpoint can we begin to articulate the negation of the negation, generating and creating prefigurative scenarios and actions that enact the better world toward which we are struggling. In the spirit of the science fictional imaginary of Ursula K. Le Guin and the liberation theology of Gustavo Gutierrez, we must engage in a simultaneous yet sequential practice of denunciation and annunciation, or as the previous speaker put it, deconstructive and reconstructive, in order to work within the capitalist present in such a way that we produce the next steps on the path toward a better horizon that is approached by the push and pull of utopian praxis. A key question then is just what we, and I mean that in all of its problematized ways, humans who are but a part of all planetary nature are to do. To this end, I want to reflect on the formation of utopian subjects capable of carrying on 
the radical utopian process. Needless to say, this transgressive process must necessarily be collective for it involves the totalizing transformation of social reality by all of us, for all of us. Settling for utopia in one person or group results in nothing but a tantalizing indulgence that is readily available for the capitalist disciplinary apparatus. Fantasizing about lotto victories, trying to live one's own life in a bubble of satisfaction, or even acting in a narrowly civic manner are not in themselves utopian. For these manifestations are but alienated abstractions of a concrete utopian impulse. No, the fully utopian unit is, must be a broad collective engaged in concrete conditions and possibilities that seek fulfillment in a radical social context that has not yet been achieved. However, such collectivities are made up of individuals and it is individual formation that I want to emphasize today. Simply put, the growth of a collective utopian movement arises from each person who comprises it. But for that person effectively to contribute to the movement, she or he must become utopian and indeed continue to become utopian. This becoming requires the individual to break from the ideological formation within which she or he has been constructed and to tear through its sutured confines so as to be able to acknowledge that the existing order is no longer sufficient. To see that something is missing and that something better can be achieved for all. Of course, this break or utopian turn is not a simple binary maneuver. Not a before and after gravitational flip on a voyage to a fixed telos. Despite Karl Mannheim's counterpointing of ideology and utopia, the interplay between the two is more complex and ongoing. As Jameson argues, the emergence of an energizing utopian impulse occurs within the ideological milieu in which an individual exists, but manifests itself as a deep change that sees the person turn against and beyond the dominant system and its formative structures. And then if viable, carries forward into organized political programs. Whether working from direct suffering or the knowledge of that of others, or with an exercise of fantastic imagination of a better life world, or in the intensity of political struggle with failures as well as victories, are often in a complex amalgam of all the above, this utopian turn may occasionally occur at a particular moment when historical conditions intensify, but generally takes place over a series of instrumental steps. <clears throat> now, my own sense of this turn at the social psychological level resonates with the work of Fritz Perls from Ralph Hefferlein and Paul Goodman in Gestalt Therapy. Publishing in 1951 in the US within the sphere of post-war radical culture that preceded the long 60s, the anarchist intellectual Goodman and the dissident psychotherapists Perls and Hefferlein brought the problematic of psychoanalysis to bear on the juncture of the social and the personal in an intervention that recognized the destructive psychological mechanisms of a post-war economic expansion that extended capitalist exploitation into the realm of everyday life, including human consciousness and embodiment. From this, they teased out the dialectical possibilities for a creative self-fulfillment that could move against and beyond it. In their project, both social psychological theory and therapeutic practice they detail the ways in which the dynamics of Western industrial society in particular and modern civilization in general desensitize and inhibit the human self in an analysis compatible with the Frankfurt School's accounts of repressive desublimation and the totally administered society. With a diagnosis that recognizes the embodiment of the self within the machinery of the social, they identify the ways in which post-war capitalism achieved the quote, unnecessarily tight adjustment to dubiously valuable workaday society. 
in which individuals are regimented to pay debts and duties. Consequently, average adults are caught in a web of responsibility toward things in which they are not deeply interested. Thus, the ideal subject for this social regime is produced as, quote, comparatively enslaved, not to the reality, but to a neurotically fixed abstraction of it. With the outcome being imbued with habitual deliberateness, factuality, non-commitment, and excessive responsibility. Conditions that certainly continue today. <coughs> Against this disciplinary regime of desensitization, inhibition, and acceptance, Perils, Hefferlein, and Goodman offer a therapeutic approach that addresses the what they call the chronic emergency and terrible actuality that catalyzes a growth process in which the self achieves a creative adjustment that resituates the person in a radical relationship with the enclosing regime in such a way that she or he can break through its barriers and emerge as an integral and actualizing person. This therapeutic process turns on what they termed a gestalt shift in which the emergent self reconfigures a new form of lived experience. In this manner, the therapist facilitates the process of persons reaching toward an individuated wholeness that produces a new subjective figure operating on, against, and beyond the ground of the established social environment. Clearly, the authors recognize that this intervention is not indifferent to present day society, but is indeed a radical intervention. One that generates deliberate awareness in the pursuit of a freer and more fulfilled existence. In this way, the future <clears throat> for the individual and the society is unblocked and held open to new possibilities. In language that resonates with the utopian Marxist philosopher Ernst Bloch, they evoke the radically reconfigured person as one who is highly aware and standing up to advanced industrial alienation in a healthy mixture of pleasure and work that can continue along a path of actualization. Now, while the problematic and practice of Gestalt therapy in the hands of these 1950s intellectuals and therapists constituted a radical analysis of an, an intervention, their proffered methods of treatment were recaptured within the growing therapy industry of post Fordist capitalism and redeployed as a mechanism for fine tuning human potential within its disciplinary regime, leading in time, as many argue, to the production of what became the neoliberal subject. Nevertheless, as a product of the post-war interrogation of consumerist economy and culture. Gestalt therapy was an important part of the anti-capitalist movement that intervened at the individual and societal levels to expose an alienated and exploited existence. And in doing so contributed to the emergent critical utopian problematic and practice that has been regenerating since then. I argue, therefore, that a progressive understanding of the individual utopian turn from the well-adjusted subject to the radically free self-actualizing agent can be enriched by the psychology of the Gestalt shift. However, I further suggest that the later political articulation of this turn by Alain Badiou offers a sharper edged analysis that aims to disable the mechanisms of the current social system. Shifting from a pre-68 to a post-68 moment and working not only within an anti-capitalist framework, but from an overtly communist standpoint, Badu nominates the break as a key element in the revolutionary as opposed to alternative or reformist process of the formation of a subject who refuses to submit to the current order of things. <coughs> Badu's elaboration of the break is for me most acutely presented in St. Paul, the foundation of universalism. <clears throat> Whereas he evokes that historical person, not as revered saint or authoritarian enforcer, but rather as a militant figure whose life most effectively exemplifies the process of an overturning at the puncto moment of an event that opens the way to the quote, transformation of relations between the possible and impossible, 
between the world as it is and as it could be. Badu explains the event as, quote, a rupture <clears throat> in the normal order of bodies and languages as it exists for any particular situation. And he cites the macro examples of the Paris Commune, the October Revolution, May 68, and the Arab Springs as examples of such ruptural moments. In his interpretation of Paul's Damascene turn, he creates a narrative of the formation of a new militant subject that makes this radicalizing problematic available at a universal register. The lesson of Paul becomes the general lesson for all radical agency. Generally occurring as part of a given historical moment, replete with political contradiction and fluidity, the event is not itself the realization of a revolutionary possibility, <clears throat> but rather is the fruitful instance that occasions the creation of new possibilities. <clears throat> Therefore, in an echo of Jameson's Cohen, this paves the way for that which is impossible in the present order of things, or resonant with Bloch, it is the occurrence of the real as its own future possibility. Consequently, an individual deeply attuned to and affected, indeed effected by an event encounters a previously unheard of possibility. One dependent on what Badu calls the grace of this radical moment. In this moment, she or he experiences a breakdown in previously secure knowledge whether empirical or conceptual or indeed bodied, embodied, and in turn stands open to the radically new, especially as that standpoint is developed in fidelity, another key term for Badu, to the conditions of that event. In this breakthrough, new subjectivity and a new way of being in the world is enabled. Thus for the likes of Paul, or any of us, the journey away from our construction and suit as sutured subjects leads through a process of ontological subversion into the creation of militant or what I would term radical utopian subjects. At this point, however, it's important to consider just how the newly, newly subverted individual can grow. Attaining a catalyzing combination of estrangement and desire for a better world is one thing, but becoming a person who has a holistic apprehension of existing society and an anticipation of one that is progressively better calls for the further nurturing of that initial desire or impulse. In order to develop the double consciousness, that wonderful term of Du Bois's, of knowing one's own existence in the present, present but also grasping the possibilities for a future that does not yet exist, the new subjective capacity must be brought forward, educare, into a fuller self-awareness of the historical and socio-political context so that it can be actualized as agency, at best in movements comprised of many such individuals. Therefore, aided by Gestalt therapy's psychological understanding of the Gestalt shift and Badu's political articulation of the eventual break, I believe that we as change agents can better nurture the deep transformation that occurs in the formation of an individual as a utopian. While many individuals who become utopian no doubt do so through a titrating series of shifts or break, there are indeed those moments of singular crisis as figured by Paul, in which the change is instantly crystallized. But in all cases, the transformation is a form of radicalization. And here, obviously, I'm reclaiming a term that has been captured by the media for other uses. Well before her monograph, Utopia as Method, Ruth Levitas presented her thinking about this process in a 1997 chapter entitled Educated Hope, Ernst Bloch on Abstract and Concrete Utopia. Ruth's central argument is that in order for the utopian impulse to be effective, it must develop into a self-aware commitment and contribution to radical transformation. It is not sufficient for utopianism to stimulate wishful thinking about a better way, way of being. It is crucial that it engages in creating it. 
Levitas therefore draws on Bloch's concept of educated hope. While Bloch acknowledges, indeed celebrates, the plethora of utopian wishing all through human history in his wonderful principle of hope, Levitas reminds us that he is critical of much of the idealized content of these wishes. And in this regard, his opposition of abstract versus concrete utopia enables him to distinguish between a compensatory wish that has no purchase on historical material change and an emancipatory understanding and action rooted in actually creating a better future. To further her argument, <clears throat> to further her argument for the concrete active development of the utopian subject and the utopian project, Levitas adopts the phrase education of desire as used by E.P. Thompson in his studies of William Morris and further developed by Raymond Williams <clears throat> with both drawing on the work of Miguel Lavensur. What is crucial for Thompson's reading of Morris's novel, News from Nowhere, is his argument that the narrative should be read not simply as satisfying as a satisfying dream, but as a realized vision. Or as Ursula Le Guin might put it, as an extended thought experiment. For in this way, the fictive project can generate a concrete anticipation of a better world by teaching readers not just to desire, but to desire more and differently from that allowed by the present order. However, Levitas reminds us that such an educated desire requires the crucial activity of judgment between good and bad, or at least better and worse, utopia. With the education of desire, quote, the disruption of the taken for granted is implicitly directed to a further end, that of transformation. Thus, the individual gestalt shifter break must not only open onto a desire for a better world, but through the process of utopian education, must engage in value-based choices within the hard work of radically making a world that has not yet been achieved. Now with the individual utopian turn, the journey only begins. For an ongoing education of desire involves not only learning, but affiliating with others in this transformative vocation as a member of a community or a collective. Or to return to Jameson's categories in carrying a utopian impulse into organized utopian programs. Here, Williams provides a schema for tracking this process. Hovering between the idiosyncratically personal and the new sociability, the emerging utopian person experiences the, experiences the unfolding of an existential and political maturation into active agency. In moving from a break or a series of breaks through encounters with others, including politically committed change agents, such as teachers, organizers, artists, therapists, as well as peers, the individual enters into what Raymond Williams came to term a new structure of feeling. In this process, a practical consciousness is enriched by, by new insights and social relations, relationships that are in solution. In a mix of thought and feeling that is in the process of growing into a more concrete comprehension of what can be done within and beyond it. Working within such structures of feeling, <clears throat> newly radicalized individuals can come together in organized learning and action and share in a stronger collective praxis. Williams identifies this next stage as one of entering into formations, which are conscious movements and tendencies in social and cultural reality. From this new matrix of collective experience, those who have been radicalized, who have been liberated from the surface dominance of a sutured reality can enter into overt political activity aimed at a utopian horizon. Now what shape this move toward programmatic activity takes is of course a key political question in any given moment, including our own. Minimally, it can begin with singular participation as a concerned human being, as it often does, but then develop into more organized activism in once off protests, 
targeted campaigns, sustained mass mobilizations, and in so doing may take the form of party, paraparty, or grassroots formations. However, this change or process develops in Badu's terminology. It involves an operation of subjectification that moves from the singularity of the individual break into a quote, synthesis of politics, history, and ideology, which leads into a combination of subjective capacity and organization. In this process, controversially, Badu argues that the subjectification implicit in becoming a communist which in its invocation of a new subjectivity reaching beyond the realms of capitalism and socialism, I rewrite as equivalent to utopian, constitutes the quote, link between social belonging to a political procedure and the huge symbolic domain of humanity's forward march toward its collective emancipation. Or more succinctly, quote, to give out a leaflet in the marketplace was also to mount the stage of history. Therefore, the individual who experiences a break or gestalt shift and who realizes that she or he is not doomed to lives programmed by the constraints of the state, and I would add market, become author, becomes authorized to become part of the larger movement and force the impossible into the possible, as Badu puts it. Now, in her own discussion of such utopian subjectivity, Jody Dean invokes the figure of the comrade as a preferred term over communist, as a more precise interpolation of the radical person who works in the world for something better. Tracing its meaning through left history, Dean describes the comrade as a quote, carrier of utopian longing, who works collectively to quote, alter our connection to the present. Working with Kathy Weeks, utopian interpretation she identifies a dual function for the comrade, one resonant with the utopian method itself. First, to alter our consciousness to the present. Second, to shift our relationship to the future. As Weeks puts it, an initial estrangement mobilizes the negativity of disidentification and disinvestment, while the articulation of hope redirects our attention and energies toward an open future with a vision or a glimmer of a better world. Importantly, Dean sees the comrade as egalitarian and utopian, but significantly as relational and generic, not strictly identified with any given identity. Thus comrades work together to quote, cut through the determinations of the everyday by moving with and beyond allied identity formations and politics into a complexly unified movement reaching for the common horizon of total social transformation. Controversially for Dean, the comrade is quote, a figure for the political relation between those on the same side. And she consequently argues that the optimal organizational form for this collective agency is still that of a communist party which she regards as the most effective form for the emancipated egalitarian organization of collective life. Recognizing the toxic history of party formations, especially as reflected upon by other philosophers such as Antonio Negri and Badiou, she nevertheless holds out for this formation as the ideal base for mobilizing commitment and struggle against patriarchal racial capitalism. Of course, she recognizes the previous failures, <clears throat> especially the authoritarian theory and practice Yet invoking the quote, courage, enthusiasm and achievements of millions of party members for over a century, she argues for this formation as one that can be refunctioned and reorganized. She values its potential for mobilizing and delivering a quote, organized response that can effectively move forward with growth, direction, equality and density. For Dean, the party can conjoin diverse struggles in a unity of action that is emancipatory and egalitarian. As an organization, it can facilitate Weeks's dual function, namely the disruptive negativity, opposing the present and the relational unity generating new values, intensities and possibilities. 
Now, for his part, Badu sees the party as no longer tenable, as do many. And he suggests alternative models, such as those found in the event of May 68. For myself, I accept Dean's argument for a unified force capable of standing up to the systemic accumulated power of the global patriarchal racist capitalist order. However, at this moment, such an organization remains at the horizon of a more developed political conjuncture. In Bloch's sense, standing as a utopian surplus that is available to once again be mobilized. Thus, I share the assessments of Negri and Badu, and at this moment prefer the, most, the more flexible and self-critical intermediate organizational formations adopted by groups as varied as Momentum in the UK, the Democratic Socialists or Black Lives Matter in the US, the Zapatistas in Mexico, or even more fully organized formations such as Podemos or Syriza. As in other post-68 assemblages, such as the Wisconsin Alliance, which was active in the 1970s throughout the US state and in which I was active, this is identified as that of a quote, mass socialist organization that mediates between grassroots activity and the organizational discipline of a party structure. While the anarchist imperative of spontaneous uprisings, temporary occupations and identity-based formations is crucially needed, it is also necessary to move with and beyond sectoral struggles and develop a larger movement with an organizational leadership structure, albeit one that is radically intersectional and democratic and governed by practices of criticism, self-criticism, so as to sustain an ongoing totalizing movement that counters the global neoliberal superpower order by building utopian political, cultural, and social spaces within what Fisher calls the quote, remorseless meat grinder of capital. <clears throat> Understood in this way, Considering now the long march from the utopian turn to the transformed horizon, and again deploying the categories of utopian impulse and program, I would argue that both can remain utopian along the way. Whereas Jameson is cautious regarding the capacity for political programs to maintain their utopian energy, since he is aware of their tendency to lose their utopian charge within a given context. I would argue that it is not that a political program or formation immediately ceases to be utopian because of its realization in a particular moment, but rather that the utopian energy, an important part of the utopian problematic, I would argue, of that realization is reduced, co-opted, or silenced when no longer sustained by a utopian impulse. There's a kind of a physics of utopianism that I'm metaphorically talking about here. As the literary critical utopias of the 1970s taught us, the more self-aware and self-critical utopian political process becomes, the more its achieved program can be refunctioned so that a utopian quality can be relaunched in yet another turn toward the horizon of the not yet. If then the utopian impulse is understood as a renewable tendency, that can draw on a disruptive and anticipatory structure of feeling and resolve into another pro programmatic alternative, then the utopian calculus is safeguarded from collapsing into an arithmetic binary of fluid impulse versus static program. Rather than being regarded as a singular utopian element, the utopian impulse can be more usefully seen in terms of its imbrication within program, insofar as it is expedited by new structures of feeling that can generate utopian energy at every point of the continuum. Sustained by radical impulse and horizon, and hopefully blossoming under determinate material conditions of development, crisis, or both, utopia's practical consciousness can then again flow through the entire process. In the existential and political work of becoming utopian, 
It is this lived element of a radical standpoint that drives political work toward the inconceivable novum. Now, given the general focus of this conference and its particular concern for theory and practice of agency, I want to end with an all too brief review of two instances of utopian energy that I believe are crucial to the radical interventions we all need to be considering and enacting. And that is the critical pedagogy, especially as developed by the Brazilian educator Paulo Freire and community organizing to me best seen in the work of the Chicago activist Saul Alinsky. This work, of course, requires an entire presentation of its own and indeed is an entire chapter in my book. But for now, I simply want to put the, product, the contributions of these two radical intellectuals and activists on the table with the hope that their particular form of praxis may prove of interest and use in these days and going forward in their own immediate form of intervention and as exemplary for other forms of utopian agency. <clears throat> Briefly then, in Alinsky's community organizing, which speaks to the movement from individual commitment to collective action, and Freire's pedagogy of, the, uh, pedagogy of the oppressed, which pushes the focus on the process back to the individual radicalizing turn, I argue that we can identify practices that produce utopian subjects capable of building utopian space and praxis. Active in left politics between the 1930s and 70s and breaking from the orthodoxies of both liberalism and the left, both created ways to radically educate desire rather than instrumentally mobilize it. Considering their projects in terms of poor people's movements, the classic study by Francis Fox Piven and Richard Cloward, I suggest that Alinsky and Freire each found ways to overcome the binary between grassroots mass defiance and bureaucratic organization, thereby reconciling, as you might put it, Luxembourg and Lenin. For Alinsky, this involved an organizing method based on local leadership and participation that favored the formation of what he termed people's organizations. And for Freire, it called for an emphasis on a dialogic pedagogy that informs the practice of revolutionary movements in such a way that both students and teachers are continually and self-critically developed. While Alinsky's grassroots organizing challenged urban and rural American power structures, rooted as it was in the utopian surplus of a radical American dream that traced its militant lineage back to Thomas Paine and Thomas Jefferson, Freire's pedagogy growing out of the decolonizing praxis of Latin America and informed by Marxism and left Catholic theology, played a pivotal role in revolutionary movements in Central and South America and was taken up by the radical education movement in the US and elsewhere. By emphasizing formation of a reflective consciousness, reflexive consciousness and behavior in each person, both projects projected and expanded the baseline of collective activism and resisted the stultifying abstraction and opportunism of long-term organizational structures. And both privileged the role of self-effacing organizers and teachers, as opposed to dominating or opportunistic leaders. By valuing the long-term building of self-aware and self-critical activist communities, they critique the authoritarian and adventurous tendencies that too often compromise and weaken the local and global left. Alinsky's organizing and Freire's pedagogy, therefore, are two iterations of the early steps, in my view, best done in coordination with mass political organizations that can be carried out in a materially grounded utopian politics that grows out of a continual process of becoming utopian. Resisting the limit cases of utopian impossibility in the present and the settled program of a co-opted or collapsed utopian vision. These complementary approaches succeeded in creating structures of feeling and formations that motivated people to grow from apathy to action, from alienation to solidarity. 
starting with the early education of desire <clears throat> and staying with the radical project as it unfolds, they keep the utopian charge alive at each step toward the ongoing realization of program and the building of a post-revolutionary society. However, if we were to accept Jameson's scandalous hesitation, as he puts it, about the relationship between the utopian impulse and the attenuation of political program, as it tends to eviscerate the utopian energies that launched it, we might well hesitate in our appreciation of both radicals. For do not both of these overtly political undertakings occasion the very sort of opportunism and tinkering that prompts Jameson to question the utopian potential of political interventions? Do they not fall into the trap <clears throat> of articulating a desired future in the iron cage of the present, getting caught in symptomatic gestures rather than concrete transformations? To be sure, as they have been co-opted by reformist tendencies, their deployment within the confines of a liberal focus on immediate electoral gain or on a non-transformative institutional approach to spirituality and education certainly meets the conditions of these warnings. <clears throat> and yet, and yet I would argue the original projects and their faithful continuations have kept to their insistence on a radical standpoint and horizon and on grassroots organizing structures as they and their allies refuse to restrict their impact to the opportunism of instrumental successes or the abstractions of revolutionary idols. For while Alinsky's and Freire's methods require interventions in the exact actually existing world, <clears throat> it is their very strategic immersion that enables, them, that enables them to develop in benighted neighborhoods, impoverished favelas, suffocating suburbs, or stultifying schools, the critical double consciousness that can lead to the utopian break required for a radical praxis. It's therefore not a matter of the consciousness of utopia abstractly preceding the material conditions, but rather of the material conditions revealed in all the hor horrific contradictions that produce radical praxis. Whether in a meeting in a local tavern, a study circle in a base community, <clears throat> a free school classroom or street mobilization, organizers and teachers create conditions in which disempowered people gain a new sense of self individually and collectively that finds meaning in struggle and victory. <clears throat> Both projects, I would argue, address the question of what is to be done and how utopian change can come about. And yet their utopian vision keeps them breaking beyond each achieved step, reflecting on the gains and limitations and moving on to the next. To be sure, Alinsky's organizing tactics often took him to the brink of an opportunism, evacuated of its utopian potential. Yet time and again, he surprised co-workers and opponents by taking the battle to the next step, reaching again toward the horizon of his version of the radical American dream. Freire's pedagogical maneuvers in their conceptualization and execution more clearly held their utopian charge. And they especially ensured that this would be the case in the early stages of consciousness raising. But overall, with their bifocal perspective, both Alinsky and Freire kept their eyes on the long distance prize of the utopian horizon, even as their close focus was on the step-by-step -step journey with and through the tendencies and latencies of existing conditions as new human subjects engaged in transformative praxis. Whether in Alinsky's or Freire's versions, such utopian processes of subject formation offer an exemplary means for all who work to realize utopia, even as they then confront the next set of struggles. And a conclusion. <clears throat> Becoming utopian consequently names the trajectory of those who break with their compliant formation, having relearned the world and imagined that it could be radically other. In this sense, the utopian project is not a matter of a top-down imposition of a plan or blueprint by a designing authority, 
but rather by a dynamic amalgam of experiences by which many break with the existing world. Now, as Isabel noted, as strangers in what has become an unfamiliar land and work together toward a utopian horizon. This collective movement rises out of each person and is trans informed by each, even as all are formed by that movement and taken forward by practices of radical organization and pedagogy. Furthermore, this dialectical process of individual and collective formation can be enhanced, preserved, and strengthened by maintaining the self-reflexive and self-critical capacity of the utopian impulse to work against the grain of what is in the name of what could be better, even within the movement, even within a realized victory. In our own time of trouble, again, referring to Haraway, as we are informed by this commitment to contribute with, to the activity of becoming utopian, we need to stay with the trouble and act within this darkness creating cracks through which the light might shine as Leonard Cohen taught us. We cannot afford an uncritical nostalgia for the former identities or politics, nor can we abstractly wish that a transformed future will one day arrive at our doorstep. We certainly cannot give up or submit, no. We need to take on the apparently impossible work of achieving the end of all forms of planetary, planetary exploitation and destruction by building new spaces, new terrains, creating new possibilities. And so to become utopian in our time is to refuse to give up, to refuse to be instrumentally realistic and thereby no longer to act as well-behaved and respectable subjects within the current terms and conditions of the present society. To become utopian is to become radical change agents Working collectively in comradely solidarity, those who consciously desire that better world have to find ways, we have to find ways to tease out the tendencies and latencies that will enable all of humanity to build it here and now in the shell of the old. Thank you all. Thank you, Professor Molin, for that very insightful talk. Uh, thank you, Professor Isabel Carmen, Isabel Carmen, for um, acting as as the chair for this uh, talk. Um, I have two questions here, uh, yeah, but before we get the questions, can I please first extend my thanks to our speakers. Please, 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 Professor Carmen. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Tom, uh, I would like to thank you very much for this very erudite lecture, I want to say. This was not just a talk, this was a lecture in its best sense uh, that showed us that utopia is not something out of reach in a vague future, but um, that has taken us through the genealogy of utopian, utopian moments in history and their continuing <clears throat> legacy for the present. I think this was very important. I would just like to also add my apologies to everyone I was actually so spellbound by this lecture that for the first time in my capacity as, as chair uh, at conferences, I completely forgot the time. Uh, therefore, I will forgo any questions that I might have myself. I will get in touch later on, Tom, and leave the floor now to uh, everybody who might have questions. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel, but let me apologize for running out of it. <laughs> <laughs> It was a delight to hear you, sir. Uh, we have uh, two questions in the chat box. Um, for the first one is from uh, Abhishek. He's writing, uh, I know this directly does not, does not concern uh, your paper. However, your response may help me in a paper that I'm currently writing, Utopia as Method or Utopia as an agentic concept could fruitfully probe ethics of coexistence and possibly expand the question of ethics in literary texts. However, while using it to study literary texts, I'm slightly apprehensive about its concealing tendencies, the contradictions that assail human existence and inform one's everyday life. Would you like to respond to that, Professor? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, yes, uh, I think I've been doing that all my life. Um, one of the threads running through this entire project this entire talk is the question of literature and narrative. Um, I began as 
an English major. Once, once I gave up being a medical student, I read too many books and became an English major. And my degrees are all in English literature. My studies were of literary science fiction and dystopian fiction. Um, <clears throat> and particularly the work in Demand the Impossible was on the, the narrative and structural formations of the utopian science fiction, primarily feminist, uh, of the 1970s. And this paper could really be rewritten in terms of the functions of literary narrative and of the utopian method in literary work. Uh, so I think there is there is indeed a, a, a direct resonance between your question and what I have to say. Um, I was talking about change agents. I was talking about facilitators such as therapists and organizers and teachers. <clears throat> but I could equally and should have really been talking about writers and texts um, and the way in which narrative changes us deeply and the way in which, and I've just come from a wonderful session on Phil Wegner's great new book on deep reading, Invoking Hope, the way in which deep reading changes us radically. It is part of this whole project that I'm talking about. And in particular, the, I'll just leave it at this, the critical utopian uh, narratives of the 70s dealt with the kind of utopian subject formation that I'm writing about here. So really the seeds of this project <clears throat> are right there in my reading of Ursula K. Le Guin and Joanna Russ and Samuel R. Delaney. I'm just telling the same story again and again, only in different prisms. Thank you for your question. Thank you, Professor. Uh, the next question again is from um, Vinya Patel. Uh, she's writing, is it correct to think of utopian project universal for everyone? Do you think this is problematic? Is the formation of the utopian subject univer univer universalistic? How can utopia capture the differences between individuals? This is a, a, a serious concern and a deep and everlasting question in <clears throat> in utopian theory and in utopian practice. And I thank you for the question. It's, it's one that continually needs to be asked um, because there is a danger of, of an abstract universalizing that comes in here uh, and assumes that all humans are utopian or potentially utopian uh, in, a, in a similar way that, that there is a utopian formation. Uh, a kind of an anthropological universal. Um, I think we have to move against that. We have to move away from that abstraction to a more concrete understanding of the utopian impulse. Whether you're looking at Ernst Bloch or whether you're looking at Donna Haraway or whether you're looking at, at Ruth Levitas working in sociology, however, or whether you're looking at Lyman Tower Sargent's wonderful bibliography of <clears throat> utopian fictions that have been written since the Renaissance, 7,000 of them at 7,000 of them at, at count. Um, there does seem to be a utopian proclivity around the world. If we define the utopian as a desire for something better, as a desire to move from suffering to not suffering, as a desire to make one's own existence and one's collective existence better. That takes different forms and it uh, is realized in different aesthetic formations. Tales are told differently. The Western utopian novel invented by Thomas Moore is not the uh, kind of narrative that you get in something like the Chinese uh, Peach Blossom Spring Tale. The dreamtime narratives uh, of Aboriginal um, cultures is not the same. There are different forms um, around the world and we need, and this goes back to the previous session, we need to break out of our, our Western hegemonic scholarly formations and find sources, find the work and think about the work in its own local terms. But yeah, I would deeply argue that, that there is something in being human that uh, 
reaches and yearns for not settling for hunger and suffering, for wanting to make the world better. Now, Ernst Bloch, I'll just leave it at this because this is a whole other conversation. Uh, Vince Gagan in his wonderful book on Ernst Bloch in the last section argues that later in his work, Bloch took Frederick Engels' dialectics of nature and dialectically twisted and turned it upside down and made it much more expansive and less mechanical and argued for a, a utopian tendency in the cosmos. Uh, so when I talk about planetary agency, I, I would go that far. But this is not to say I'm talking about some kind of uh, singularly universalizing formation or some sort of magical, mystical formation. Uh, thank you, Professor Molin. Uh, I'll now hand this back to uh, Shraddha and Zehra if they have uh, uh, questions that are coming. Thank you so much. Uh, Professor Moylan, you would be delighted to know that I have so many questions that I cannot keep up with them. They're coming that quickly. Uh, but we'll just take a couple of them because we know we're running out of time and you're a busy person too. Uh, if the chair permits, uh, Shogata sir would like to ask a short question. Is that okay, Professor Karaman? Thank you so much. I'm unmuting you, sir. Are you getting unmuted? Yeah. Uh, no, thank you very much. Uh, only if time permits would I like to put forth my question, uh, and I presume that it uh, will. Um, so, uh, I, I thank you very much, uh, uh, Tom Moylan, for this wonderful talk, and it would have set before us uh, quite uh, an agenda, let's say, to be able to uh, reformulate the strategies through which we solidarize our worldwide struggles. But I was wondering whether, and in a continuation with the, with the previous question probably, whether what is to be considered as utopian by some uh, does not in turn become dystopian for others and vice versa, because uh, most of the fascist regimes also uh, gain their currency by being able to sell some model of utopia or the other, and which uh, people are ready to purchase. And uh, to draw a line between what may be considered as radical utopia, which or I believe in, and what may be considered reactionary utopia, maybe the categories that were uh, brought forth by you, like whether it's from the top to the bottom, or whether it's really engendered by the people themselves, that may not work necessarily in of social media and all that, when even the, the fascistically minded, utopia-seeking uh, people also probably organize themselves from the bottom up rather than necessarily being puppeteered by uh, regimes from the top bottom. And neither can the transnational planetary networks work. Because, uh, now we have transnational fascist networks. Fascists of the world are also uniting. They have their own networks, they have their own transnational networks. So I was wondering if a, if a primary uh, demarcator, as it were, to be distinguished between what is radical utopia and what is reactionary utopia, a utopia that you and I may be ready to believe in and distinguish ourselves from the other utopias that are also being sold, would take us back to the etymology of the term utopia itself, non-space. So any utopia that is still looking in an imagining of a space, a nationalistic state, a nation state, a space, a space driven identity that is finally sectarian in nature, that however it may posit itself to be utopian is not utopian because it's etymologically not non spatial Whereas that kind of utopian vision, which is fundamentally non spatially driven, which does not aspire to nation states, which does not aspire to identities, which does not aspire to rootednesses, only that may qualify as radical utopian. So I would like your comment on this as to whether a return to the etymology of a non-topicity would be essential to distinguish between uh, these competitive utopianisms, many of which are actually fascistic in nature. Thank you. Thank you for your question, uh, an absolutely important question. Um, and one that I think it's, it's the responsibility of anybody working in this field uh, has to take on. Um, let me switch it somewhat 
I take your entomological etymological point, but let me switch it to the epistemological um, and go back to two key uh, points made by Frederick Jameson, which would be my starting point. One is that he, he talks about uh, utopia or utopianism. Uh, he describes it as that it's best understood and engaged with as a problematic. And by problematic, he describes it as a set of categories by which we interrogate the present and interrogate what is and is not in the present. So to, be, and so to begin with, utopia is a facility, a problematic, a capacity. Um, and here I might use the capital U utopia for that distinction. And then in his very important conclusion in the political unconscious, he takes on the Karl Mannheim binary of ideology versus utopia. Mannheim had uh, identified, as you know, ideology as that which reproduces a given society and utopia as that which interrogates and changes. And Fred, as, as he would, renders this into a dialectical re relationship. And he says that the effectively ideological must necessarily be utopian or have a utopian germ. Um, and this, he then goes on to say in just the paragraph below that, that section, that this is, and he mentions it exactly as you do, what happens with fascism. That the ideological formation and power system of fascism works by way of tapping into a utopian desire. And of course, we could go into echoes of Lacan here uh, to understand that, that, that the desire for a better existence is always tapped into by authoritarian movements. And indeed, if we were to push it, always tapped into any socially operating movement. Every society has its own set of aspirations. So what makes utopian radically utopian then, if it's, if it's simply a problematic? Um, that's then I think where we move from understanding utopia in the capital U category to the small u formation of a set of ideas, a set of positions that arises from very specific social movements, very specific social populations. And here comes another com uh, concept, and that is Ernst Bloch's important distinction between abstract and concrete utopianism. Abstract utopianism is a alienation of utopian desire into a fixed formation that is highly idealized and then imposed back on an existing population. Uh, and of course, Bloch is writing about this while in the middle of experiencing the abstract utopia of fascism in his own country. <clears throat> and as such, abstract utopianism engenders a form of memory that looks backward, not to inspire us, to drive us forward, to drive us to change, but to constantly reproduce, to constantly return and return and return. Uh, abstract utopianism works in a cycle. On the other hand, concrete utopianism, <coughs> excuse me, is based in the material conditions and reality of given populations. And that grows from the grassroots up and out. Um, and that's the kind of utopianism that Jameson would be arguing for, that Bloch is identifying, that I would be identifying. Thank you. The top-down aspect of it um, is there. Any smart authoritarian organizer is going to tap into that grassroots desire. But, but if you look at that, that grassroots desire is tapped into in a alienated form, and it's enforced back on people. And this is why I, I brought up Belinsky and Freire, because as practitioners, as organizers, as teachers, or us as teachers, uh, we need to listen, deep listen to the people that we work with. 
And the utopian impulse has to always be teased out and nurtured. <clears throat> but at the end of the day, it gets back to Ruth Levitas and her point that the utopian position is a position of standpoint, is a position of judgment. Um, but yeah, utopia is a very dangerous problematic mm -hmm. and it can be hijacked and misused as quickly as anybody wants to. And neo neoliberalism, of course, has advanced its own set of a utopia and a utopian project. So I very much thank you for your question. Thank you so much, Professor Moylan. If the chair permits, we have a question all the way from our Gmail inbox. Okay, but let's make it a short question and a short answer because we really need to come to an end. Okay, uh, so this is from Maxim Shadulski and he thanks you for your highly inspiring paper and he says he really enjoyed it. Uh, I'll just go right to the question that he poses because it's pretty self-explanatory. He asks, may the Thulu scene figure as a precondition or a post-condition of becoming utopian? Put, say that again. May the Thulu scene figure as a precondition or a post-condition of becoming may, utopian? I, I didn't get the term. May I? Was, was that holo scene? Uh, this is Donna Haraway's conception of the Thulu scene. Got it. A, a condition? Yes, so he's wondering whether uh, you can look at this figure as a precondition or a post-condition of becoming utopian. Uh, thank you, Maxime, for your question. <laughs> That's a very good one. Um, I very much believe in the shift from the Holocene to the Anthropocene as, as a problematic, as a descriptive category. And I would go further to take Jason Moore's notion of the Capitalocene, uh, or indeed um, Haraway's own Cthulhu scene. There is a deep temporal shift, temporal historical shift going on, and we are in the middle of it. Um, <clears throat> the Holocene is over. We are in the middle of something new and emergent. And if there is going to be a utopian movement forward, it has to be out of those new conditions. <clears throat> the very trouble that Haraway is asking us to stay within. And this is what I meant about avoiding nostalgia. <clears throat> I've been picked up on that because there's a lot of good to be said about nostalgia. And I don't mean nostalgia in that abstract ossified way. I mean, we need to look forward to new ways of being and we need to listen to each other more but as Haraway and so many other people are arguing, we need to listen to non-humans. We need to listen to the earth itself. Um, and insofar as that shift from the Holocene to whatever uh, is going on, we need to deep listen and work with it. If we would love to continue listening to your profound thoughts, um, uh, Tom Moylan, um, I think we uh, need now to uh, move toward a close of this session, um, even though it's not the end of the conference. Um, uh, I think we have a vote of thanks uh, to conclude this session. Well, may I only say thank you all uh, very much for this, and I wish we now could continue into the evening. That would be wonderful in a better world <laughs> over drinks. Thank, Thank you so me. much, Professor Moylan, for your thoughtful insights. I'm sure I'm speaking on behalf of all of us when I say there's so much to ponder and reflect. It was absolutely an honor and a privilege to hear you speak. Thank you once again on behalf of the whole conference team. And I would also like to take this opportunity to thank Professor Isabel Karaman for presiding over this session and making it all the more meaningful. Thank you so much, ma'am. I would now like to invite Zahra Rizvi to deliver the word of thanks. Over to you, Zahra. Thank you so much, Indrani. You've already done it so good. I feel like, what should I say now? But before I really start with the word of thanks, I would just like to point once again that Professor Moylan has been kind enough to send us a discount flyer. I've posted it in the chat box. Please make use of it. It is just for our conference attendees. Thank you so much, Professor Moylan. Uh, and Good evening, everyone. It has been quite a day. And on the behalf of the conference team, I would like to thank everyone who made today as successful and enjoyable as it was. A huge, huge thank you to our special keynote speaker, Professor Tom Moylan, who has not only truly provided us with tools for utopian thought, but also excited conversations which will continue well into the future. Thank you for lending us so much of your time and your fabulous research. 
Thank you also to our fantastic keynote speaker, Professor Lilt, and our brilliant plenary speakers, Professor Bradley, Dr. Manoj Anvai, Professor Ananya Jana Rakhbir, Maso Ari Gautier, Professor David Shalkwik, and Professor Miriam Walraven, our dedicated chairs, our wonderful paper presenters, all the tireless reporters and the members of the conference team, as well as our fabulous participants who turned up from various time zones and made today a huge success. Thank you so much. As day two comes to an end, I would also like to invite all of you to our upcoming sessions tomorrow. We start at 9.30 a.m. IST, and we have a brilliant lineup throughout the day, including plenary sessions by Dr. Parui, Dr. Gairola, Professor Label, Professor Arif, Professor Suman Gupta, Professor Radhika Subramaniam, and Professor Francisca Ferrando, and of course, the valedictory address by Professor Deepesh Chakraborty, which we're all very excited for. Thank you, and see you tomorrow. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. I see you. you. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye, <laughs> Isabel. Thank you so much, Isabel. See you tomorrow. Bye, Zeno. Bye.